Hi. <laughs> Hello, best friends. Welcome back to our safe, cozy space of the big wide internet. I am so glad that you're here and I hope you're doing really, really well. I expected that to be so much more awkward because it's been that long since I filmed a video, but that was like muscle memory. Like pat on the back, Liz. Good job. I did, however, forget to check if I have anything in my teeth before I start filming. So we're not doing like A+. Plus. I would give myself a solid B. If you are new here, my name is Liz and I'm so glad that you randomly stumbled across this video today. It's like fate. And as well as me being really happy you're here, our resident emotional support angel, Lily, who is just casually, you know, catching some Z's in the background, she's really happy that you're here as well. And she joins us for every hangout. So if you want to, we can like hang out some more and just be best friends forever and ever and ever. But no pressure been a while since I did that. Oh my goodness. Throwback Liz. If you're not new here though, you know I haven't been here in a while. Honestly, this break was mostly involuntary. Like it was like fate took a look at me and was like, hey Liz, you look like you need a break. And I was like, are you sure fate? Because I feel fine. And fate was like, no, 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 trust me. I got you. Let's just like bring on a whole lot of COVID for the entire family. Let's throw in like a laptop breakdown where you lose all of your notes and all of your write-ups on all of your cases. And is there anything I'm forgetting? Oh yeah, like a huge just dose of anxiety. And I was like, thanks, fate. <laughs> she was like, you're welcome. And now here we are. Thank you so much for all of the messages and all of you guys checking up on me and being like, Liz, where the heck are you? You guys are the best. And thank you so much for reaching out and caring and checking in that everything is okay. You guys, you are the best. Just putting it out there. Just to state the obvious, of course, our safe space has changed a little. I kind of wanted something just a little bit more cozy and casual and like more me, more you. And I hope everyone's on board. Lily is clearly on board. Right, Lily? Yeah, it's your new best spot. Do you love it? She's like, don't bother me. I'm sunning in everyone's attention. But enough housekeeping and catching up. Bottom line is, I'm so happy to be back. I miss you guys so much. And let's get on to today's case. And today's case is wild. Like it's one of those ones with so many twists and turns and big reveals. And it's a case that even though it is technically solved, we are going to have some questions to go over in the end. Like there's, there's a lot to unpack. Heads up, this is one of those cases with quite a few key figures to keep track of. Hopefully you guys are able to keep up because like I said, it's freaking wild, but I'll try and keep it as straightforward as possible. So our case today takes us to where Justin Bieber famously gets his peaches, Georgia, USA. But more specifically, we are headed to the small city slash town of Springfield in Effingham County, Georgia. We're at about 3 a.m. on Monday, the 25th of of August 2008, a woman that was quite well known within that small tight-knit community named Linda Height made a phone call to 911. And it was very clear from the moment that that 911 call connected that something was very wrong. Linda was panicking and distraught, but it ended up taking about six minutes for the dispatcher to finally work out what had happened because at first the only words that Linda was able to get out was gun and shot. Linda herself had been shot in the face and as a result she was missing a large portion of her lower jaw and part of her chin and the bullet had travelled through to her shoulder where she had a large gaping wound. So this was why she was having so much trouble communicating what had happened and yet by some miracle she was still alive making this 911 call. Like Linda's a badass clearly and we have barely even touched on what she went through that night but as the police were on their way back to this 911 call, Linda was able to tell the dispatcher that she wasn't the only one that had been shot. Her husband, 59-year-old Philip Height, had also been shot. And the only other person in the house, her and Philip's 32-year-old son, Kerry Height, she didn't 
didn't know if he had been shot or if he was dead or alive or even if the intruder, the gunman, was still in the house as she was making this phone call. So obviously just an absolutely terrifying scenario. And when police arrive, they find Linda slumped against the side of the kitchen bench, holding her cell phone in one hand. And in her other hand, she's got this piece of fabric held against the side of her face, just trying to stem the flow of blood. And she's obviously still conscious and able to communicate a little bit, but she's in really rough shape. And so she's immediately rushed off the scene to hospital for life-saving emergency surgery. Meanwhile, police started making their way through the home, again, unsure if the intruder was still inside the home. And this was made even more daunting by the fact that they knew if the intruder was still in the house, they were not going to be able to use their weapons because the house had been doused in gasoline, so much gasoline that they had been able to smell it from the road outside the house when they pulled up. And now inside, they're literally slipping around on the ground. There's so much of it. So they know that any gunshot at this point is very likely to cause an explosion that's going to take all of them out. Luckily, the shooter had fled the scene by the time police arrived. But in their search, police did find Linda's husband, Philip Hyde, who'd been killed by a single fatal shot in the head. And Philip had actually pulled the blankets up over his head to try and shield himself from this shot before he was killed. So he had clearly been awake and alert and likely stared at his killer in terror before they murdered him. Police also found Kerry Hyde, Linda and Philip's son, who on the phone call, Linda had said that she wasn't sure if he was alive or dead, but unfortunately, Kerry had also been murdered, also with a single shot to the head. And he had most likely been the first one that had been shot because he was still laying tucked up in bed in one of the spare bedrooms. Linda herself had been shot last and considering that all of the shots were from very close range we're talking roughly two feet distance it was a miracle that she was still alive and likely the only reason for that was because she had turned her head at the exact moment of impact of the bullet. Now Linda as we said had been rushed from the scene to hospital because she was in really really rough condition and the next thing she remembered was waking up in her hospital bed four weeks later having been in a coma slash in and out of it all of that time, just not really unconscious the whole time, but not really with it. Linda's jaw had also been wired shut, making communication even more difficult as she was told that both her husband, Philip, and her son, Carrie, had been fatally shot that night and that investigators had been waiting for her to wake up and be able to talk to them, hoping that she would be able to identify their shooter. When she was able to talk, Linda told investigators that that Monday night had just been a usual calm, relaxed night for her and Philip until their son, Carrie, showed up having had a big fight with his wife and asking if he could stay with them that night until things cooled off, for which they both readily agreed to. And later, Linda had been in the ensuite of the masked bedroom doing like a word search because I guess she was having trouble sleeping when she heard a very loud sound, so loud that her first thought was that it had been a lightning strike hitting Philip's sleep apnea machine. And so Linda came out of the bathroom and the instant after she said Philip's name, there was a loud flash and a bang and she realized that Philip had been shot. And then the very next instant, it was Linda herself that had been shot. And like we said, she turned her head at the exact moment of impact and that's how she survived. The bullet went through the lower left-hand side of her face through to her right shoulder. After shooting Philip and Linda, the gunman left the room, probably not even realizing that Linda was still alive. And so she made her way to the landline phone in the master bedroom. But when she picked up to call 911, she realized that there was no dial tone because the phone line had been cut. And at this point, Linda passed out and lost consciousness for an uncertain amount of time. When she did regain consciousness, Linda specifically remembers looking down and seeing her teeth on the floor beside her. And she also had the realization that her clothes were wet, but not with water or blood or although I imagine there was a lot of that, but it was gasoline. She knew from the smell. Linda would actually write in her diary later that she knew what hell smelled like. 
gunpowder and gasoline. And she says that she doesn't know how or when, how she managed to make her way down to the kitchen and grabbed her cell phone and made that 911 phone call. Unfortunately, though, while investigators had been hoping that Linda would be able to identify the shooter, she told them that all she had seen was that flash when she was shot. She had never seen the shooter themselves, so wouldn't be able to identify them. But I mean, obviously, in the four weeks that Linda had been recovering in hospital, there had been an investigation going on. And what Linda didn't know was that police already had a suspect or suspects in mind. But before we delve into the investigation and the suspects and the motives and all of that, we are, of course, going to rewind and learn a bit more about the Height family themselves, starting, of course, with the matriarch and patriarch, Philip and Linda Height. Philip Height was born on the 24th of September, 1948, and he was raised in the Christian church, grew up very devoted to his faith, and was very involved in his church community throughout his entire life, even serving on the church council. Straight out of high school, Philip enrolled in the Georgia National Guard and served for about 20 years till 1987 when he retired and moved into real estate, which was something that suited him down to a T because by all accounts, Philip was a very likable, personable, and prominent member in his community. He always got along with everyone he crossed paths with. He was the kind of guy that never met a stranger. So back in the 1960s, when young Philip met a young Linda at a Savannah County Fair, he just immediately stole her heart. She says he swept her off her feet and they started a whirlwind romance that resulted in a very sturdy, stable marriage. Their marriage had lasted 42 years before the shootings and Linda and Philip were on it. They dated for a short while, got married and then started their own little family. And over the next few years, the couple welcomed no less than three baby boys into the family, starting with Philip Craig Height, who went by Craig, followed by Chris Height and then the baby of the family, Carrie Height. And the Heights really were that definition of a tight knit family unit. Like the boys were all said to be very different, but they all had the same strong moralistic values. And they were all raised with that same Christian faith that Philip had had because that was really important to him. And Linda says that while there was at times conflict, because there's no such thing as a perfect family, there was always love. And as well as his family, what was also important to Philip was business, obviously real estate business. And he was very successful to the point of being a multi-million dollar mogul in the real estate industry, making his millions in the development of residential, commercial, and industrial properties. Philip even once held the prestigious title of the president of the Savannah Board of Realtors. And as if being this super respected and prominent real estate businessman didn't keep him busy enough, Philip also was really invested in the raising of cattle on the Hyatt family farm. And he was a member of multiple prestigious associations and boards in that field as well, as well as just in the community itself, serving at one stage as the president of the Chamber of Commerce. So to put it simply, Philip had really made a name for himself and he was very well respected as both a businessman and a family man in the community. Everyone knew how important Philip's family was to him. And Linda was seen as a wonderful, supportive wife and mother, and the couple's three boys were seen as pillars in their community as church-going, God-fearing men of strong morals, just like their parents. Carrie Height, the youngest son born on the 10th of June 1976, was said to be the most like his father personality-wise, being well-liked by everyone that knew him and fun to be around. He loved boating and fishing and caring for his horses. And honestly, it seems like he and Philip were so alike that Carrie's life kind of mirrored Philip's. Kerry met his wife, Robin, when both of them were young, very young, in English class in their senior year of high school. And they started out as friends, but quickly fell in love and dated and were married very quickly out of high school. They had three kids of their own, and the kids were aged 11, 8, and 3 at the time of the shootings. And Kerry was said to just be a wonderful, caring father who loved 
spending time with his kids. Kerry also ended up being the only Height son to follow in his father's footsteps into real estate, and he also was very successful, and the two of them actually became business partners. Kerry and his dad, Philip, owned the very successful Century 21 Height Realty in Rankin, Georgia from 1984 till 2004. And I know I've hammered at home, but the two of them, along with the rest of the Height family, were very successful, well-respected men members of the community. Everyone liked the Heights. Everyone respected the Heights. So this, of course, leads us to the question of who could have wanted the Heights dead? So back to the day of the murders, the 25th of August, 2008, the Effingham County Sheriff's Department dealt with an average of about one homicide per year. And now all of a sudden they had two homicides plus one attempted homicide on their hands. So they were immediately like, yeah, we're not equipped to kind of handle this investigation on our own. And also I think the sheriff was quite close to the Height family themselves, I think with them being such a prominent family in the community. And he felt like this might hinder his ability to investigate this case effectively. And so the sheriff's department pretty much immediately called in the GBI or the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. (laughs) In my notes, I have misspelled bureau so incorrectly that even spell check gave up on me. Like, yeah, no, Liz, you are on your own. But anyway, thank goodness they brought in the GBI straight away because at the crime scene, the sheriff's department had been pretty certain that they were dealing with a double homicide suicide, even though there was no gun found on the scene or any shell casings. But when the GBI walked in at 8.45 a.m. the morning following the murders, they pretty much were like, no, 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 this was a double homicide attempted homicide and it's all been staged to look like a robbery gone wrong but very poorly because like we know the phone line had been cut but also one of the glass panes in the back door had been smashed to make it look like that was how the shooter had gotten in but the door had actually been accessed by a key in the lock that had been left there. There was also nothing of value that had been taken even though there was tons up for grabs like jewellery, cash, car keys, a lot of it left in clear view. So whoever the perpetrator was, this effort to stay the scene was A, pretty half-hearted, or B, more likely had been interrupted when they heard Linda making her 911 call and they had fled the scene before they had a chance to set the house and Linda on fire with the gasoline they had doused everything in. And so with robbery ruled out as a motive, this meant that the murders themselves of Kerry and Philip and the attempted murder of Linda was the motive. Hi, did you need a break from all your hard work back then? there, hey? It's hard work being loved and adored, isn't it? Honey, this isn't your spot. You can't stay there. I guess you can stay for a little while. (laughs) Very little physical evidence was ever found at the scene. They didn't even bother searching for DNA evidence because as this was a hands-off attack, i.e. a shooting, the investigators felt that there was very little chance of finding any of the shooter's DNA on the scene. There was fingerprint dusting completed at the scene, but it was a case where this was a family home that had multiple family members, including Linda and Philip's seven grandchildren, Mm. constantly in and out of the house. So it was just a case of fingerprint, lay it on fingerprint, and there was nothing of substance to actually be lifted and point investigators in the right direction. Oh, okay. We're done. (laughs) It's not even a lily break. It's like a sass break. And as we said, there was no gun or shell casings found at the crime scene itself. So investigators were going to have to wait until the autopsy results came back to even find out what kind of gun the shooter had used. So the GBI did initially do the rounds. They looked into and ruled out a local drug dealer. And they also went to Philip and Kerry's office to go through all of their paperwork and business dealings to see if maybe there had been some beef in the real estate world, maybe a deal gone wrong that could have driven an associate or a client or a creditor to want to murder them. And all of this turned up nothing. But I feel like the GBI were really just ticking off their boxes at this point because they knew from very early on that whoever the killer was had to have been someone much closer to home because the key, remember the one that had been left in the back door that had the broken glass pane, that key 
key was usually left outside, hidden in a storage room in the carport at the house, and the only ones that knew about this key were members of the Height family themselves. I know, right? The picture perfect Height family. There was trouble brewing just underneath the surface because... There always is, right? And sure enough, one of the officers at the Effingham Sheriff's Department told one of the GBI investigators that he had had a conversation with Kerry just a couple of weeks before the shootings. And this conversation had taken him by complete surprise because Kerry had told him that he knew that his wife, Robin, was running around on him, as in Robin was having an affair. And Kerry had never told him who Robin was cheating on him with, but the very morning of the murders at 5am, police knocked on Robin's door and told her the devastating news that her husband was dead as a result of the shooting. And it didn't take much pressure from them for her to admit that she had been having an affair and that it was with none other than Craig Height. You guys remember Craig Height, right? The eldest Height son, Carrie's old brother. Yeah, that Craig Height. Uh, Robin was having an affair with her husband's older brother. She went there, Lily. She went there. Yes. So this affair began back in April 2008. So roughly five or six months before the murders. And it sounds like it all started super romantically. Um, Robin said that she one day approached Craig and told him that she had feelings beyond the usual brother and sister-in-law feelings for him. Yeah, so super romantic. And to Robin's delight, Craig let her know that he reciprocated those feelings and the affair just took off from there. I mean, obviously there was more to it than that. Firstly, we have to talk about Craig. Craig Height was the eldest Height son. He was divorced. He had two kids with his ex-wife who he owed child support to, and he was unemployed and living off disability checks due to a back injury. And like everyone's got their own path, right? Everyone's got their own struggles and their own life choices and decisions to deal with. But For Robin, as a mother of three young children who was self-admittedly married to a man that was a wonderful husband and father, what was it that Craig had on offer that Kerry didn't? To put it simply, time. It was time. I don't know if you will remember, but back in 2008, there was this itty bitty incident that we call like the housing bubble crash pop bang. (laughs) You know, like the housing market crash. It was really bad. And it brought the industry, the real estate industry to its knees. So this obviously was a huge deal for both Philip and Kerry. And so as a result, Kerry had been spending a lot more hours at the office that he would usually be spending with Robin and the kids. And on top of this, while Robin could tell, of course, that Kerry was stressed and anxious, rather than talking to her about it and like expressing his feelings, and all of that, she said he kind of closed her out. And so they were feeling disconnected. Robin's feeling neglected and like her husband doesn't have time for her. And meanwhile, his brother, Craig, seems to have nothing but time on his hands. And so starting this affair was a life decision that they made. But Kerry, while he was busy and stressed, he wasn't stupid. He could tell from very early on that something was up with Robin and Robin felt bad. And so even though Craig told her not to, Within two weeks of this affair starting, Robin told Kerry that she was sleeping with his brother. And to say that this broke Kerry is just an understatement. He told Robin that he just wished with his entire heart that it could have been with anyone else but his own brother. But Kerry did not believe in divorce. He had told Robin this from the very beginning, from when they got married, that this was for life. And so they had spoken about it. He was willing to try and forgive her. They were going to go to couples counseling. And Carrie told Robin that for this to have any chance of working, Craig was no longer going to have a part in their lives or their children's lives. They were cutting him out completely. And out loud, Robin agreed to all of this, of course, but on the down low, She had no intention of ending the affair. It was almost like she had just told Kerry because she knew he suspected something anyway and she just wanted to get it off her chest and get it off her mind. And now it was like, 
oh cool, like they could just continue their little fling. And so not only did the affair continue, but it actually just got more intense after Carrie found out. Like Craig was living in one of the Height family's hunting cabins in the woods and he and Robin would use this cabin as like their rendezvous point and would hook up there all of the time. And Carrie, knowing about the affair but not wanting to split up his marriage and his family, kind of had no choice but to watch it play out, watching his brother and his wife have an affair. Now, here is where things get really messy, though, because not only had Kerry confided in that officer at the Effingham Sheriff's Department, he had also confided in his father, Philip Hyde. And Philip was pissed. Like we said, Philip had grown up in church. He had that really strong set of morals and values, and Philip felt like he had instilled those same morals and values into his sons, who he loved but also expected the best from. Like he expected them to all be making good life decisions. And I think we can all agree, raised in church or not, sleeping with your brother's wife, not a good life decision, Craig. And so Philip was super unimpressed. He tried to talk reason into Craig, but he was unsuccessful successful and eventually he had enough and gave Craig the ultimatum that if he didn't end this affair with Robin, he would simply cut him out of his will and he would lose out on his inheritance, which was worth multiple millions. And as the months passed and the affair still continued, even Kerry had enough and he actually removed Robin as the beneficiary in his life insurance, which was worth 3.5 million. And he instead had it put into a trust fund for their three kids. Something for you to bookmark for later, though, is that Robin was blissfully unaware that she had been written out of this life insurance policy, and she wouldn't know until after the shootings took place. But Robin did fight back against the Height family, who by now were in total turmoil over this affair, over the damage it was causing Carrie, let alone her and Carrie's three kids. And there was this big confrontation between Robin and Philip one night where she went to his office and confronted him about interfering with her and Craig, telling him to basically stay out of it and leave her and Craig alone because it was none of his business. And Philip's response was to be like, no, I can't stay out of it. This is my family. And we all know how important Philip's family was to him. And according to Robin, when she attempted to leave the office and kind of get out of this confrontation she'd started, Philip yelled at her, pushed her arm and attempted to snatch her keys off her as she was leaving. So clearly this had all reached a big head and this only happened not long at all before the shootings took place. So now that we have a clearer idea of the Hyde family and the intense drama that was going on behind the scenes, we are going to circle back to the weekend of the murders, starting on Saturday the 23rd, the day before the shootings took place. That Saturday night, Robin was actually meant to go to a slumber party for one of the teachers at Guyton Elementary School, where she worked as a teaching assistant, but one of the teachers had gotten sick, and so the slumber party was cancelled, and so Robin thought... You know what? I'm going to go home and spend time with my husband and work on repairing this marriage. Just kidding. Robin didn't even tell Kerry that the slumber party had been cancelled. She instead took advantage of the fact that he wouldn't be expecting her home that night and beelined her way to her and Craig's hookup cabin in the woods. And they had a cozy romantic evening in. They had drinks, did their thing. No big deal by now, right? But the very next morning is where things started to seriously go off the rails when Robin and Craig were very rudely awoken by a literal helicopter flying very low in circles over the cabin itself. Yeah, it turned out after his run-in with Robin in the office the other night, Philip had called in a favor from a friend, a friend who owned a helicopter, and he had asked this friend to fly the helicopter over the cabin and get hard photographic evidence that the affair was still ongoing. And this friend would later testify in court that the way Philip had 
had approached him was to say that he needed his help with an issue that was tearing his guts out. So this friend obviously agreed and he got photos of both Robin and Craig's cars at the cabin at the same time. And just so we're all on the same page, this friend was also a friend of Carrie's and he was in on this helicopter plan as well. Anyway, both Robin and Craig were fuming that their privacy had been invaded and in such an extravagant and over-the-top way. And they both knew that it had to be Philip because who else would have had the means and the motive to call in a helicopter to take photos of them? And so Craig offloading and probably also pissed about the confrontation between Robin and his dad at the office the other night, he says something to Robin along the lines of, my dad and Carrie better watch themselves or I'm going to quote unquote, go old school on them. I know so many air quotes, but the thing to know is that Robin would later tell the police that she had no idea what Craig meant by this at the time. Not long after the helicopter incident, Robin goes home to cook up a Sunday lunch for Carrie and the kids after they got home from church. And not long after lunch, she and Carrie get into that big, massive fight about <laughs> the helicopter, about the affair, all of that. And this is the fight that causes Carrie to leave the house that afternoon and go and stay at his parents because you remember he was staying at the house that night of the shootings. And Carrie leaving the house after a fight like this was something that had never happened in 13 years of marriage between him and Robin. So for Robin, this might have been finally like a wake-up call. Like this affair was not something that could continue indefinitely. Like things were going to eventually come to an end one way or another. And this was when she called Craig and filled him in about the fight and told him that Kerry would be staying at his folks at night. And so investigators feel like this was the point that Craig feeling like his inheritance was in jeopardy with Philip and that Kerry was standing between him and his happily ever after with Robin decided that it would be a totally logical solution to go to the Height family home and murder them. And Linda was either collateral damage or Craig didn't want her to be able to identify him as the shooter, or he felt like she was standing between him and Robin as well. And so he shot her as well. But as we know, Linda is a badass and she survived. Now, the morning after the murders, like we said, police went to Robin's door, told her about the shooting and asked her, of course, if there was anyone she could think of that would have wanted her husband husband and her father-in-law and mother-in-law dead. And she told them not one person came to mind. Even after this lead up with Craig and him telling her that he was going to go old school on them, she was like, no, no one I can think of. But obviously things had changed by that afternoon because she confronted Craig and just straight out asked him, did you do this? And he told her no, that he couldn't believe that she was even asking him that. And she believed him. And Craig told investigators the same thing, saying he had no idea who would have wanted his family dead. And when investigators just straight out asked him as well, well, was it you? He said no, that there was no way he could have done this to his family. And when they confronted him about his affair with Robin, he denied that as well, saying that there had been no sexual activity going on there, even when they told him, dude, like, Robin told us, we know. But Craig was like, no, guys, for real, there's no sexual relations going on there. Like, I know it looks bad, but Robin actually just came to the cabin that day to have a shower before a baby shower. <laughs> And then a few days later, Craig walked through the crime scene with investigators and just blurted out without being prompted, without being asked to anything along these lines, that his shotgun was missing, his 12-gauge shotgun. And this was before the autopsies would reveal that a 12-gauge shotgun had been used in the shootings. And Craig also went on to blurt out that also missing from his home was a pair of his boots and a gas can. Craig did have an alibi for the night of the murders, but it was just that he had been at home at the cabin by himself watching hunting and fishing shows. And there was no one that could corroborate this story for him. And he did a polygraph test as well, where he failed some very important questions like, 
like, were you holding a shotgun at the time of the murders? And when asked, did you shoot your father, mother, and brother, Craig's response was, I don't know. If I did, I have no recollection of it. So we're just days into the investigation and it's no big leap of faith for anyone to believe or suspect that Craig was the shooter. And so working on a hunch, one of the investigators asked if Craig could remove his shirt. And when he did, the investigator noticed three bruises, two on his right bicep and one on his left, consistent with Craig having recently fired a shotgun. And yes, for those counting, that is one bruise per shot fired in the house that night. However, Craig had a story to explain these bruises that had nothing to do with him firing a shotgun. He told investigators that he had just been innocently having a shower when all of a sudden he had tripped and fallen out of the shower and like nearly headfirst into the toilet. Who hasn't been there? The old fall out of the shower into the toilet, like headfirst scenario. So relatable. Taking into account everything else in the investigation though, investigators were suspicious of this story. And so a bunch of them went to Craig's house and had him reenact this fall out of the shower into the toilet. And the <laughs> and they recorded it. And the only footage I've found of this so far, it's been really poor quality. So I probably won't be able to include it, but you can trust me on this. It's just as awkward as it sounds. And there is slight like, shots of Craig just literally putting his head pretty much into the toilet and all of these investigators standing around asking him questions, even at low quality. It is quality viewing. Unfortunately, though, for detectives, even though they were pretty much 100% sure that Craig had been the one to shoot Philip, Kerry, and Linda, literally all they had was circumstantial evidence. They had no DNA, no murder weapon, no fingerprints, no eyewitness accounts, except from Linda herself repeatedly telling them that Craig was not the shooter. And so with nothing physical to link Craig to the crime at all, they were left with no choice for the time being, but to kind of ease off and hope that at some point in the future, he would incriminate himself so that they could swoop in and arrest him. Hi, are you working hard there in the background? It is such hard work being such an emotional support angel, isn't it? And knowing how much everyone has missed you, there's so much pressure. Don't worry, you're doing fan fantastic. Okay, so as the months went by after the shootings, Craig and Robin had been keeping things very, very low key, maybe even taking a break. But come December, they rekindled their romance and come January, Craig moved in with Robin and her and Carrie's three kids full time. So Craig was living in his brother's house, sleeping next to his brother's wife, even driving his brother's prize truck around town. And all of this definitely set tongues wagging around the small community of Springfield, with people basically feeling that not only had Craig wanted his brother's wife, but his brother's life. But Craig and Robin were clearly unfazed by these whispers floating around town because nine months after the shooting, they were engaged with plans to move to Charleston, where Robin's mother lived, where they wouldn't have to worry about their every move around town being scrutinized. And they were being scrutinized. People had Things to say. Like Robin even lost her best friend because she didn't agree with Robin moving on with Carrie's brother after he was murdered. Things came to a crashing halt though for Craig and Robin's happily ever after when the GBI decided that, you know what, they did have enough to go in and arrest Craig. And he was arrested on the 22nd of May, 2009. After a couple of delays, Craig's trial started on the 1st of December, 2010. And it lasted for two weeks and the prosecution told the courtroom that Craig had gone to his parents' house on a night that he knew his brother Kerry would be staying there and he used the key that he was one of the select few to know about to gain access of the house and then methodically went room to room, shooting first his brother Kerry, then his father Philip and then finally his mother Linda. And they said that his motive was to secure a future with Robin, to gain access to 
to the $3.5 million payout from Kerry's life insurance and to gain back his share of Philip's estate that Philip had threatened to write him out of. Which, if you're a terrible person, all sounds like pretty strong motive, but it is still circumstantial and still the best physical evidence that the prosecution could present against Craig was the photos of the bruises and the defense brought in their own expert who testified that the bruises weren't in the places you would have expected for an experienced hunter like Craig having fired a shotgun recently. This expert said that Craig would have been having to hold the gun at an odd angle that wouldn't have been expected from an experienced hunter but the prosecution just came back with well this was a bit of a different scenario to hunting a deer in the woods. You know, we're talking murder and attempted murder, the potential panic and heat of the moment of that. It's not likely that Craig was stopping to think, oh, am I holding the gun correctly? And there was every chance that the gun had slipped in between the shots that he fired. The prosecution also showed the footage of Craig's reenactment of his freak fall out of the shower into the toilet accident, something they were criticized for later, but the courtroom did get a few chuckles. And I think the absurdity of this story that Craig had come up with to cover up for the bruises definitely helped their case against Craig. There was also some physical evidence presented against Craig in court that I haven't mentioned yet, where literally on the day of the murders, police found several 12 gauge shotgun shells in the bed of his truck. But he did tell police that he did own a 12 gauge shotgun. It was just missing. And he was a regular hunters. So there was nothing to say when these shotgun shells got there, if they were from a hunting trip, it just didn't really hold that much weight. There was also a letter that Craig's defense team had Linda read aloud in court because even at this stage, even at trial, she was still completely convinced of Craig's innocence. And the letter had been written by Philip just weeks before the shooting. And part of it read, son, I appreciate everything you do. Remember family is important and we will always be there for each other love dad. And the suggestion was going by the tone of this letter that things weren't exactly as dire between Philip and Craig as the prosecution were pushing. And even that they were potentially in the process of making amends to their relationship. But the prosecution pointed out that this letter had never actually made its way to Craig because Philip had never sent it before he was murdered. And it seemed still just very unlikely that the two of them had buried the hatchet when a real estate state agent took the stand to testify that she had had a conversation with Craig just a week before the murders about a piece of land that she had on the market that he wanted to purchase for him and Robin. And when it came up in this conversation that Craig himself didn't have the funds to make this purchase, he assured her that he would be coming into some money very soon, presumably his share of Philip's estate. And when Philip did come up in the conversation later, he casually said that the two of them weren't getting along and that he would not urinate on his father if he were on fire. And then Robin Robin took the stand and pretty much shocked everyone when she said that she hadn't had contact with Craig since February, so a few months before his arrest. Coincidentally, the same month where she was arrested for threatening a witness and ordered to move to Charleston. So she hadn't spoken to Craig since then. And Robin said that she had been feeling like guilt and doubt about the relationship for months before things ended. She'd even been telling her sister that she wished it was just her and the kids moving to Charleston without Craig, but she didn't want to hurt his feelings. And so she had a guy from her church tell Craig for her. And apparently Craig was pretty adamant at first that no, he was moving to Charleston with Robin and the kids, but eventually he got a clue and the relationship dissolved. And now on the stand, Robin pretty much threw Craig under the bus saying that she had originally completely believed in his innocence, but now she wasn't so sure. Maybe Craig was the shooter. Now, a lot of people around town, and I'm sure a lot of you by now, were really suspicious of Robin and whether she had had anything to do with the murders as well. Like the sheriff said, once Craig was arrested, he was getting calls from the locals on a daily basis asking when Robin was going to be arrested 
as well. But considering how little physical evidence there was against Craig, they had literally nothing on Robin. And when she was asked on the stand if she had had any part in the planning or carrying out of the shootings or if she had encouraged Craig to kill his family, she said that no, she had not. Craig himself never took the stand and in the end the jury only deliberated for about six hours before coming back and finding Craig guilty on all counts including murder, battery, burglary and attempted arson. All of this remember with the only physical evidence linking Craig to the shooting being those bruises. There was no DNA, no fingerprints, no murder weapon and Craig was given the maximum sentence which was two life sentences plus 80 five years, making parole a virtual impossibility. Craig did appeal his conviction in 2013, citing multiple arguments including, but not limited to, insufficient evidence and being unfairly denied a change of venue for his trial. But this appeal was denied and now currently in his mid-50s, Craig is still currently incarcerated at the maximum security Georgia State Prison in Reedsville. Both Linda Height and her son, Chris Height, Craig's brother, defend Craig's innocence to this day and Linda's kept a really low profile it seems like in the years since losing her husband Philip and her son Carrie a big part of which seems like she came under a lot of suspicion from people just not able to believe that she believes that Craig is innocent that she knows he did it and for some reason is trying to cover for him but while Linda has always very vocally defended Craig's innocence there is a report from a police officer who was staying guard on her door at the hospital while she was still recovering. And this officer says that the day that Craig came in and went to Linda's bedside and held her hand and said, Mum, it's Craig, I'm here, Linda's blood pressure shot right up. And while she couldn't talk, her eyes went super wide and it looked like she was literally shaking in fear. You know, just another reason that investigators had been hoping that when Linda was able to talk, that she would identify Craig as the shooter. But Linda says she's not sure exactly what it was that elicited this response in her when Craig came into the room. She just knows it wasn't a fear response as it was interpreted, that it must have just been something to do with her being kind of still in and out of it, but registering that he was there and recognizing his voice. A little side note here is that the same officer that gave this report also said that Craig asked him not once but twice how long he would be guarding his mother's door. But like you can just read into that however you see fit. But we of course have to circle back to Robin before we go. Robin actually continued living in Effingham County until the end of 2011. But in November of that year, she remarried and moved to Charleston with her new husband and three children. But she did find that she was still indelibly tied to the Height clan when a court ruled that she would have to share custody of her and Carrie's children with Linda. It's hard to find out the exact exact reasoning behind it all, but in December 2011, Linda was actually granted temporary immediate custody of the children before the joint custody agreement came into effect. And at one point, Robin actually spent two days in jail for failing to hand over social security payments for the children on time. But that is where this case stands as of today. And I guess to kind of wrap up, I wanted to address that whole thing there is in true crime of like solved versus unsolved and how a lot of people say that it's the unsolved cases that get under their skin a lot more. But for me, it's almost equally these solved cases that uh, yes, solved, but are they fully solved? Because Robin, right? Did she have a part in the shootings or the planning of the shootings? Did she orchestrate the whole thing and then kind of pin it on Craig and get away with it? Like if I'm honest, on one hand, I find it like insurmountably impossible to believe that she had no idea about the murders or what Craig was planning. But on the other hand, there's no evidence to say that she had any part in it whatsoever. Like there's no recorded conversations. There's no 
text conversations. There's no one coming forward saying, well, Robin told me this or she did that to say that she had anything to do with the shootings, not even from Craig himself. And yes, we know that Robin made what some might consider some interesting life choices. Interesting life choices do not make you a murderer, right? And I watched this special. I think it was a Dateline special. I'll have it linked in my sources down below, but there was this interview with some of the jury members that truly had me shook because the vibe you get is that they were disappointed that Robin wasn't on trial right alongside Craig because they would have convicted her as well. And I'm sitting here conflicted enough with Craig's conviction. Like I feel in my gut that he did it, but I'm like, was there reasonable doubt? And so the idea that the jury that convicted Craig probably would have convicted Robin as well is just a very scary thought to me. But maybe I'm overthinking it. I don't know. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this case. Tell me what you think about Robin. Tell me what you think about Craig. Talk me off this ledge because, geez louise, these circles that my mind has been making while researching this case, I'm dizzy. But thank you so much for hanging out with me today, best friends, and thank you for being so patient with me. I'm so happy to be back because I miss you guys so much, so much, so much. It's been so long. I can't really remember how I usually sign off, but you guys know all the things anyway. If you're not already subscribed, I would obviously love if you did that so that we can hang out forever and ever and ever and be best friends forever. You guys can also find me and Lily over on Patreon where I plan on putting up more like catchy uppy videos where I get to just literally sit down and chat. Or if you guys have had interesting comments about like last week's video, then I can kind of debrief and address them on Patreon. So yeah, you can find me there. I'll put a link down below with everything else and yeah. Hey, pretty girl, you come to say bye. Oh my goodness, you work so hard today. Thank you so much for spending this precious time with me and Lily today, guys. We hope you have the best week ever and we will be counting down the hours until we see you in the next one. Bye. You're not. No. On the